Good morning, church, and welcome to church at home. Change is in the air. There's a phrase you hear every once in a while, and surely it applies in this week of change, in a season of change, in what has really been a year of change with all of the norms and the conventions blown away by the coronavirus and all that's happening in the world around us. Well, this week has certainly been a week of change with Storm Ellen blowing through, taking away the really good weather we had last weekend, leaving a bit of a mess in my garden. The exam U-turns on results and all those changes that really leave a lot of children from GCSE and A-level and B-Tech really not knowing where they stand with school and university courses. And then there's all the travel changes, the regulations and the imposing and the relaxation of, of different uh, um, travel policies all changing. People trying to get back from France to beat a deadline and people really not know where they stand in booking holidays. And as for church services and getting back together, meeting inside church, I really don't know where we stand at the moment. Well, how are you with change? Do you love the vibrancy and the unpredictability that it brings? Are you that kind of person? Or do you like the dependability of things just being conventional and normal and kind of everything in its place? Are you that kind of person? Well, I suppose it all depends on whether we perceive it as good change or as bad change, depending on our mindsets and so on. Well, what does the Bible say about change? It has a lot to say. First of all, God never changes. He doesn't need to because he's perfect in every way. And secondly, us, we need to change. The fleshiness, the worldliness, all of the insecurities, the self-centeredness, that has to change in a life in Christ. But thirdly, and this is where it really gets good, God gives us the power to change. It's only the indwelling of his Holy Spirit that gives us the strength to make real and lasting change in our lives. And finally, and maybe this is the most amazing one of all, if you think about it, why would God, master of the universe, the perfect one, choose to use us to be his agents of change in a hurting and a broken world around us? But he does. For scripture attests that Jesus, he handpicked a small bunch of people he poured his life for three years and he poured his Holy Spirit into each of them. He gave them purpose and they turned the world upside down. Now here we are telling that story over 2,000 years later. God chooses vessels, broken though we are, calls us to his purpose, fills us with his spirit and sends us out to do his work. So wherever you're at this morning with change, remember these things. God's in control. And Romans 8 and 28 says, All things are worked together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So as we welcome you this morning to church, may we all embrace change, the change is happening with excitement and through the eyes that, uh, God, of faith that God would give us. So as we join this morning, let us pray. Lord, we come to you this morning as the perfect, the changeless and the constant one who never fails, who never runs out of patience concerning us, your fallen creation. Lord, today may we know your presence as we devote this time to you. Lord, may you speak to us, may you steady us, may you lift us up, and God, may you change us, and may we know the voice of your Holy Spirit with us where we're at. Lord, this morning we give you our full attention. May we leave this hour more committed as holy vessels in your service. Be Lord of this time. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. And now the team are going to lead us in a time of praise and worship. I encourage you, regardless of who's in the room, turn the volume up. Don't be passive. Be a participant. Praise this amazing God. And allow his Holy Spirit to challenge and change us, even as we sing praises to the Most High God. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing 
just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking
mercy never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay in my head I will sing of the goodness
Ian is going to lead us in a time of communion. So we would invite you to come to bring the elements and to participate in this moment of devotion to our Saviour. Ivan has been reading Paul's exhortation that each of us should examine himself or herself before taking communion. The Church of England and probably most Christian churches suggest that every believer should have a short quiet time each evening to review the day, consider what we might have done differently to better reflect the glory of God to those around us. If we're to be mirrors reflecting the goodness of God, we need to keep the mirrors clean and uncluttered. Now examining ourselves does not mean comparing ourselves to others. We are each a unique piece of God's craftsmanship and we reflect that in the way we serve him. Throughout scripture, the Lord does not repeat miracles to a formula, they're one-offs. Strike the rock one time, speak to the rock another time. Jericho was a one-off, Samson was a one-off. And those heroes of faith in scripture had their unique flaws. Now imagine a stained glass window. The light outside may be the white light of midday, but inside the picture glows with colour the way the designer intended. We are God's handiwork, bought back from the slavery of bad habits, bad thoughts that we call sin, and remade to do good works, as Brian will be saying later. As the Presbyterians put it, Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Communion, when we now remember Jesus' death by breaking bread and sharing a cup, is part of that enjoyment. So as you break bread in your own homes, remember the price paid on the cross and be humbly grateful. Amen. In a moment, Pastor Brian is going to complete the second part of the series that he started last week. But first of all, let's read the words from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all of its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is his King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on when you are watching and listening. And uh, today we're going to talk again about walking worthy of the calling of Christ on our lives. Uh, when we take the name of Jesus, everybody's watching us, and above all, that you're watching our hearts and lives, and we want to live lives that commend the gospel, that uh, demonstrate to the world that salvation makes a real difference in us. And so today, I, I want us to look at how we deal with sin. What are some of the practical things that we can do in cooperation with the Holy Spirit 
so that we can le lead transformed lives and become more and more like Jesus. I want to speak first of all to any non-Christians who are watching and listening. God loves you. Jesus died on a cross for you. But you have something to do to make that real in your life. There are two things that you need to do, actually. One is to repent. Repent of the sin, the selfishness in your life, the pride that keeps you from asking Jesus into your life. Just honestly talk to God uh, about the need for change in your life and say that you're sorry. Secondly, you need to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you to bear your sin, to carry your sin away, and that his blood washes away sin forever. Thank God. That's the good news. For Christians who are listening, and the majority of you are Christians, I want to begin today's talk by considering again how serious sin is in God's eyes. Uh, our priority in life very often is to be happy, to have enough money, to be healthy, to be popular, uh, to be understood, etc., etc. But when we read the book of Romans, we, we see very clearly that the problem that God has had with mankind since the fall is sinfulness. It's a very big problem, and it has to be dealt with. It can't be swept under the carpet. So let's get rid of our excuses and let's get rid of the sin in our lives with God's help. Just to illustrate how challenging and how uh, important this issue is, I want to comment quickly on one of the seven letters to the churches in Revelation. These were letters uh, transcribed by John the Apostle but dictated by Jesus they are letters from Jesus to these churches, and they make challenging reading. Uh, you can read this yourselves in Revelation 3, 1 to 6, but to summarize, in verse 1, there's a, an ironic statement that the, the church in Sardis had the name for being alive. But then Jesus says, but you are dead, spiritually dead. What a statement. He commands them in verse 3, what you've received and heard in the past, return to the truth. Go back to where you were with God uh, before you fell and repent. Consistently in these messages is the need for Christians to repent if they have fallen short of the glory of God. Then there's a very severe warning. If they do not repent, and that's not everyone in the church, some are clothed in white, it says, but if they do not repent, those who are sinning, Jesus said he will come as a thief. In other words, at an unexpected time, suddenly, without warning, he will come and deal with them. But if they repent, let me quote verse 5, if you overcome, you will be clothed like them, that's the Christians who have not sinned, in white robes, and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Now you cannot blot someone out of the book of life unless their name is already in it. So it's a very sobering, challenging message from Jesus, not just to this church, but to all seven churches. Two of them uh, are not given, as it were, criticisms. Uh, and ironically, they, they consider themselves to be weak and, and uh, inconsequential, but they have been faithful to God. God is not looking for success in our lives in worldly terms. He's looking for faithfulness, obedience to him. Now let me uh, reinforce this by looking at a famous passage in Psalm 24. That's verses 3 to 6. And Trevor read out the entire Psalm earlier for us. But just to repeat these key verses. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Now what does that mean? 
The hill of the Lord is a place of intimacy. It's a place of meeting with God. For example, Moses going up the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. So who's entitled to have an intimate relationship with God? And who shall stand in his holy place? And then the answer is given. Those who have clean hands, their behavior is righteous. And pure hearts, their motivation is righteous. Who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully. One of the great problems of sin in our lives is that we can deceive ourselves and excuse all manner of behavior, which is sinful. But in some ways, we justify that, and that becomes an obstacle to repentance. So we must not lift up our souls to what is false. We must live in honesty before God and let him search our lives and our hearts. And then here's the promise if we do these things, if we live honestly with God. They will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication, forgiveness if you like, from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. God wants us to seek his face, but we can only seek his face properly if we have first been cleansed by the Lord, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now the heart is deceitful. I've touched on that already, but look at this scripture from Jeremiah 17, 9 to 10. The heart is deceitful above all things. Wow. It's the number one source of deceitfulness in the world is the human heart. And desperately wicked. That's our natural condition. Who can know it? Who can know our heart? And this is one of the great keys to transformation. Even if we examine ourselves, we will not see everything as God sees it. So we must allow what the next statement implies. I, the Lord, search the heart. So God searches our hearts and he exposes in us the things that he would regard as sinful. Now, we can have then have two reactions, as I said last week. One is we can harden our hearts, resist the Holy Spirit, and continue sinning. Or we can be honest with God and honest with ourselves and we can repent of whatever God shows us. In Psalm 139, 23 to 24, the writer of the Psalm gives us a prayer that we should pray for ourselves on a regular basis. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Expose my heart. Show what you know about my heart. Try me. That means to test me, to see how genuine my heart is. And know my thoughts, so my, our minds are tested as well. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So eternal salvation is linked with a process of what we call sanctification of God searching our hearts and minds and exposing things that he does not like and giving us the grace then to ask God to help us to change. We'll never change ourselves by our own efforts, but God can give us the grace to change. Now, if you like, this process is summed up in a wonderful passage in 1 John 1, 6-8. If we say that we have fellowship with him, if we claim to be Christians and have a living relationship with God through Jesus Christ our Lord, and we walk in darkness, so it's positive for, possible for a Christian to walk in darkness, we lie and we do not the truth. In other, this is the King James Version. We, we're not expressing the truth. We're not really in fellowship with God if we're walking in darkness. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, 
we have fellowship, not just with him, but with one another. It's impossible for those who are living in the flesh to have fellowship, true fellowship, with those who are walking in the Spirit. Because as we saw in Galatians, there is enmity between the flesh and the Spirit. They're at war with each other, both within you and me, but also sometimes within churches where the flesh rises up against the Spirit or the Spirit challenges the flesh and there can be all kinds of reactions. Okay, so we need to walk in the light. What does that mean? That means, again, asking God to search us, to shine the light of His truth into our hearts and into our minds so that God can expose any darkness whatsoever in our lives. So if we walk in the light, here's the promise. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. All sin. Now, sometimes our sins seem very small to us. For example, we could be arrogant with people. We could be rude. We could be irritable. We could have all kinds of what we consider to be just, I'm justified in being angry. I'm justified in being rude or whatever. Or what we consider to be big sins like murder we touched on last week. But actually, in God's eyes, sin is sin. And the penalty for all sin is the same. And there's only one way for us to be forgiven, and that's by the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank God for the blood. Let's ask God to cleanse us by the blood of Christ. If we say we have no sin, says John, we deceive ourselves. And now, don't forget, he's writing to Christians. He's not talking to non-Christians here. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, if we confess our sins, here's the solution, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins, praise God, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is possible to be cleansed from sin, but only if we're honest with God, humble ourselves, confess our misdemeanors, Stop blaming everybody else. Stop making excuses for ourselves and genuinely embrace the light of God. And light is often uh, a symbol in, in Scripture for His truth. Let's embrace the truth about Jesus Christ and the truth about ourselves and confess our sins. Our constant attitude has to be this in Romans 12, 1 to 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, again, obviously a message to Christians, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Most sin is an attempt to appease bodily desires or passions. Many, or at least many sins are. There are sins of the mind and the heart as well, of course. Uh, But our bodies, the body that you've been given and I've been given by God, are to be temples of the Holy Spirit. They're to be vehicles wherein we live in this material world for His glory. Let's allow our bodies to become living sacrifices. Not, of course, a sacrifice like in the Old Testament, because there's only one sacrifice for sin, and that's, that was the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable in the light of what Jesus has given for us. It's reasonable to give him everything in return. That is the prayer that I have for myself. May you pray this prayer today. Dear God, my body must be a living sacrifice for you. And Lord, give me the grace to deal with any sin that is an obstacle in my life, especially the sin of pride, which rises up to defend ourselves and defend the indefensible before God. 
And then a very useful uh, instruction. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't say, well, everybody else is doing it. Or I know somebody down the street who's doing this, so why not me? Well, actually, the Bible says that we shouldn't be like the world. We should be salt and light. We must be different. There's no point in preaching to people or sharing the gospel with them if your life is just like theirs. And above all, we must embrace the command to love God with everything that we have and love our neighbor as ourselves. When the world sees a community that loves, it will be challenged. Amen. So don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is good and acceptable and perfect, what is the will of God. Prove there partly means to demonstrate, demonstrate the will of God in our lives by allowing him to transform our minds. Praise his name. Now I just want to close with a kind of summary of some of the key points. First of all, don't live in condemnation. The devil's trying to discourage you, to get you to quit. What's the point in being a Christian? I'm such a useless person. How could God possibly love me? Well, he does love you. And that's just the voice of the enemy. So don't be condemned. You and I are made righteous because of what Jesus did, not because of what we do. But welcome the conviction of the Holy Spirit. With the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes hope. Hope that we can be changed by God. Hope that we can become more like Jesus. Secondly, walk in the light. Don't walk in darkness. Don't walk in self-deceit. Repent when necessary. And when you repent, believe that you're forgiven. Thirdly, change what you are thinking, doing, or feeling. Genuine repentance brings change in our lives. There's something that we need to be able to look at as evidence, if you like, that repentance has been genuine. By the way, sometimes sinfulness is so ingrained that this is a process, so don't give up on yourself uh, and don't see temptation as sin. The devil will try to drag you back into that sin. Resist the devil and he will flee. That's the promise. Fourthly, walk in the, the Spirit and crucify the flesh. Every day we must allow the flesh to be crucified. Fifthly, forgive everyone right away. For a lack of forgiveness is sinfulness and it breeds bitterness and animosity in our hearts. So let's forgive people just as the Lord has forgiven us. Sixthly, let the Lord sanctify and heal you. Allow the Holy Spirit full access into your life. Allow him to change you. Uh, eighth, sorry, seventh, be aware that the unsaved are watching you. Very important that our testimony is upheld. Not that we're perfect, but that we're honest and loving. Eighthly, grow in love for God and let him change your heart. Ninthly, Whoa, listen to this one. Love those who treat you badly. Well, we treated God badly, and he still loved us. And that person that we don't get on with, watch out for this, God loves them. Jesus died for them on a cross. So let's allow God to change our hearts towards people. Number 10, love the beauty of holiness. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, it says in Psalm 96, verse 9. There's a beauty in holiness, in purity. We must embrace that, that kind of beauty. Do not make others responsible for your walk with the Lord. Very important scripture, Philippians 2.12. Wherefore, my beloved as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And that's my last word on this subject. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I can't be responsible for your reaction to the Lord. I can only be responsible for mine. 
you can only be responsible for your reaction. What is God saying to you as, as you listen to this talk and indeed as the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you already? Respond positively when you hear the voice of the Lord. May God grant you the grace to become more like Jesus. What an ambition God has for us. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we ask you in Jesus' name to move in our lives, to convict us of sin. And Lord, as we worship you, help us to allow you to cleanse us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brian, for this challenging word this morning. May the Lord really write that word on our hearts. Thank you for joining with us today. And can I ask you that you would pray as the church begins to emerge from lockdown with the ever-changing regulations that we uh, go with wisdom uh, and observe the guidance given, um, but learn the lessons that God has been speaking to us that we don't just go back to life as normal. Please come and join with us on Wednesday evening, 7.45, via Zoom, as Pastor Brian is bringing the Bible studies. Please, can you hook up with the prayer meetings for the two church assemblies? It's good to be praying with one another, corporate prayer. God is answering corporate prayer. And then please come and join with us again next week when Mark Anderson from Listen to Dill brings the Word of God all the way from County Armagh. So in the meantime, stay praying reading God's word, serving him where he's placed you, and be mighty people of faith. Amen.